All right, so um, I would ask that if you have a Bible or a device, I want you to turn to the book of Colossians. And Colossians is part of what we call epistolary literature. That means that it comes in letter form. So you have in the New Testament, or not in the Old Testament, New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the four Gospels. Followed by the book of Acts. Followed by the highly doctrinal book of Romans. Followed by the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then we enter into those shorter epistolary books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So you're going to have to move along in the New Testament to Colossians chapter 3. And, you know, at the the beginning of the summer, I said, typically what we're going to do during the summer is we're going to focus on various parables of Jesus in the morning, and then we're going to look at the matter of um, what the Bible has to teach us about the importance of prayer, what prayer is and how we should pray and so forth. Well, what we're doing this morning is we're letting go of the parables just for this one Sunday, especially in light of what we're going to do at 7 o'clock tonight in our praise and worship gathering. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the beauty, the blessing, and the importance of music in the church. What should we think about music? What should our music look like? Um, How can music be a blessing to us? We're going to be looking at those kinds of things from the book of Colossians here. So what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and read just through verse 17. So let's draw our hearts and minds now to the word of the Lord. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as The Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Now, verse 16, especially, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing hymns, Uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So again, we're going to be focusing on verse 16 where the Apostle Paul talks about the importance and the beauty of singing in the church, particularly psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, um, one thing, if, if you have a Bible or device, turn back a couple of books, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. So it goes Colossians, you turn back one book, and it's Philippians, and then you find Ephesians. And go to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. We read very similar words, not identical, but similar words to what we found in the book of Colossians. Verse 18 of chapter 5, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So there you have two places where the Apostle Paul is, number one, speaking to members of a church in Ephesus, a city named Ephesus, and then another one uh, to the members of Colossa. But essentially, essentially, not identically, but essentially he's saying the same thing, that we're to lift our praises to the Lord with both our minds and our hearts, particularly singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I don't have to tell you, if you've been in the church any amount of time, how, you know, today we hear, well, we've been hearing about this for probably 30, 40 years, what we call worship wars. And it used to be, not so long ago, a couple generations ago, if you would go to various churches of various denominations, you would find that the liturgies or the orders of worship were really quite similar, and the songs that they sang, not identical, were really quite similar, but in the last couple of generations, now you have the introduction of other songs, and some of them are very beautiful, and some of them are very trite, and it's, it's, it's good for us as a church to kind of go, well, How should we be singing, and what should we be singing? And the Apostle Paul addresses both of those things here in both Ephesians and what we're going to be taking a look at is Colossians, that we're going to be singing with all our hearts, that we are to be taught 
in the songs that we sing, that we should admonish and exhort one another in the songs that we sing, and we should provide occasions for praise and thanksgivings with the songs that we sing. What songs? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Listen, music is very important in the church, right? And it's very interesting that I think when when people outside the Christian faith start going to church, a very interesting thing takes place, and that is, am I really loud? Okay, it's okay. All right, so I'm not going to speak more softly. There we go. All right. So when we start, when, when individuals come into the church and, we, and, they, and they, they come into the worship of the church, for those of us who grew up in the church, we have to realize what, what a different atmosphere this is for them. And I'll tell you why. It's because when, when you're not a part of the church, how many times you think, or how many occasions you think are provided with what we call unchurched people? How many occasions are provided where they gather with people together and they sing? Not very often. People will sing in their cars. People will listen to music all the time through various devices. But very few times will non-Christians get together and they say, hey, let's get together. And then you have 100, 200, 300 or more people singing together. That's got to be a very weird experience. But it's not weird when you consider what the Bible has to say about music and what the church has been historically practicing throughout the years. So we're going to look at the importance of of music here this morning. And I want to begin with this. When we sing, like we've been singing throughout our worship service so far, the, the intent of music is not only to instruct us and to feed us with God's Word, and I'm going to draw our attention to that in just a moment, but it is designed to shape both our hearts and our lives. And what's in the human heart And what happens in our lives is a very close connection. And it's very interesting. The reason why I say that is because because when you look at the context of the book of Colossians, or the text that we're looking at in the book of Colossians, you see in the immediate context how much of an emphasis the Apostle Paul has on this, on the human heart, and how music is designed to shape our hearts. For instance, A.V., can you put on that that first uh, point? Take a look at these texts, if you would. Here's the context. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, notice what he says, put on compassionate hearts. Also, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Obey in everything with sincerity of heart. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord. You notice how many times it doesn't, doesn't talk about the mind, doesn't talk about the will, it talks about this, the heart. Why does he address the human heart? Because the human heart for all of us is at the very center of who we are. The Bible recognizes that. That's why it says, for out of the, the, the heart flow forth the issues of our lives. The mouth speaks that which fills the heart. The heart, the heart, the heart. God is is deeply concerned about our hearts, which then directs what's in the inside of our hearts, helps then translate into how we live out our lives. And one of the ways that God helps shape our hearts is through music. And you might say, well, usually... Um, When I think about the human heart being shaped and the mind being informed, I think of preaching. I think, Pastor, that's what you're doing right now. You're instructing us, you're teaching us, and hopefully you're helping shape our hearts and telling us how to think about things in a very pragmatic, practical way for our lives. That's what preaching should do. Well, it should. But that's not the emphasis here. It's not preaching. It's music. So we're going to look at three things this morning in regard to music. The purpose of music, according to the Bible, at least in this passage, is to teach us, it is to admonish us, you know, I'm not sure what that word means, I'll explain that in a little bit, and the purpose of music is to provide the occasion or the opportunity for us to lift our praises and our thanksgivings to God for everything that he has given us in Jesus. Those three things, okay? Number one. 
music, and I, I don't know if you think about music first and foremost in this way, but it's a very important uh, intent or design of music, and that is sacred music in the church, and that is to teach us, to form our minds, to instruct us, right? Listen, listen and, and instruct us in what? To instruct us in this, and what the Apostle Paul refers to as the word of Christ. Listen to what the text says. If you take a look at the text, it says this. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you, in here and in here, through what? Through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The word of God is designed to instruct us. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why King David, who was in charge in the building of the temple, had 288 professional musicians, think of that, 288 professional musicians as part of the temple. One of the reasons so that not only could God's people lift their praises to God, but also so that God's people could be instructed in the Word of God. Let me, um, uh, in some ways this is kind of hard to say, but I think there are many occasions, and maybe you can say an amen to this in your own heart. But I think there are a number of occasions where, yes, we can be moved by the preaching, kind of depending where, where we're at in life and what passage of the Bible the pastor is preaching on. But I think there are a number of Sundays where we leave this place and we are more indelibly affected by the music than we were by the preaching, just by the songs that we sing. Music has a very powerful place in our lives for instructing us and moving us. Let me give you an example of that. In 1528, the great reformer Martin Luther finished his, uh, what was famous called, uh, Luther Shorter Catechism. A catechism is a teaching tool to teach people basic truths of the faith. And Luther finished that, and, and many people know this, that Martin Luther, if you study any church history, you know that Martin Luther was a very accomplished theologian, very bright man, but not many people know this, that Martin Luther also was a very accomplished musician. And what he did with his shorter catechism as a teaching tool for people was to set a number of those catechetical truths to music. And there were many Roman Catholic priests who believed that these damnable heresies of Luther could have been squashed to some effect if he didn't go ahead and put his catechetical truths to music. That's how we taught adults, and that's how he taught children. When, when um, our family was church planning in Springfield, Missouri, we sent our, our kids, who were younger at that point, we sent them to a, um, an evangelical Christian school in, in Springfield. And I remember, I believe it was my daughter Aria's class, where at one point in a program, all the kids got on a stage like this. Or I don't know, must, there seemed like there were 50, 50, 40, 50 kids up there. And what they did is they rehearsed, they had memorized, and they rehearsed the entire book of James in the New Testament. And I remember this, that the teacher taught, put, put those words of James to, to simple little melodies that the kids had to learn. And the way that kids learn and the way that the word of Christ was embedded in their hearts and their minds was by speaking James according to various simple melodies. I find that very interesting. One author put it like this. He said, God has given us music in order to make this vivid and memorable to us. So again, here, here's the thing. We, in our circles, we talk about the primacy of preaching. Preaching is the most important thing. We spend the most time in our worship services with preaching because we want our minds and our hearts informed and shaped. Great. But sometimes we, we, we kind of put music a little bit to the side. But music is very, very important to, to undergird this and embed this into our minds and our hearts and our lives. So, listen. Um, music is intended to instruct and embed the Word of God in our lives. Okay, secondly, 
Music is intended to admonish us. Now, when kids hear the word admonish, they go, what does the word admonish mean? Maybe some of us as adults are kind of going, I think I know what admonish means, but I'm not quite sure. The word in the original language means to, to take warnings and teaching and encouragement and place it into our minds and our hearts. So when you think of admonish, think of encouragement and exhortation, but also think of warning. Have you ever thought about music in that way? I mean, listen to the text again. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, but notice, and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's an admonishing function to music. Now, I can about guarantee that most Christians today, whatever church you go to, are not thinking about that side of music, the admonishing intent or purpose of music. And then you think about it. Here's something I want you to think about. How many modern songs today have an admonishing function to them? You can go to um, a popular publisher of music today, Hillside, Hillsong, Hillsongs, right? Very popular. You go to different churches, they'll sing a lot of Hillsong stuff. A lot of people like it. And there's some songs that are fine. But if you engage, I'm just talking about one segment of music, Hillsongs. If, if, if you look at the music, very rarely, if at all, will you ever find any kind of strong exhortations or warnings. Like, here's the exhortation. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. And to sing that with vigor. Or a warning, like beware. I mean, think of all the warnings in the book of Hebrews, right? Never put to really music today. And you find that there's the warning, do not sell your birthright like Esau, who sold his spiritual birthright for a piece of this world. You just don't find that today. This is why what we do is we take the best of contemporary music, but we combine it with the Psalms and the historic hymns. Why? Why? Because what you oftentimes find with psalms and historic hymns, that upon occasion, you have strong admonishments. Okay? For instance, A.V., will you put on that next uh, PowerPoint? Take a look. Psalm 95. Okay, this comes from what we call the book of praise. Many of us are familiar with that. Psalm 95. Come praise the Lord. Let us rejoice and let us make a joyful noise to him, the rock of our salvation. That's the exhortation. That's our encouragement. Praise the Lord. But notice this warning. This is how, this is how Psalm 95 ends. For 40 years they wearied me, said the Lord. They hardened their hearts and resisted my favor. And so in my anger I swore in my, uh, in my rest that they will never enter. They'll never enter the promised land because they have turned against me, basically. That's what the Lord is saying. That's how the song ends. And I think when we, when we read that, we go, well, that's kind of a depressing end. Or if, if Christians from other churches may visit us and we would sing a song like that, whether to the original tune or a different tune, whatever, if you just look at the content, I think a number of fellow Christians would go, wow, that, that ends on a dark note. Yes, it does. Because it comes in the form of a warning. Search your hearts. Make sure you're walking with the Lord. Make sure you're pressing on to the promised land lest you miss it. Admonishment, okay, admonishment. One other thing, here's a hymn. A.V., will you put on the next one, please? Take a look at this. Here's a hymn in our hymnal. Day of judgment, day of wonder. Day of judgment, day of wonders, hark the trumpet's awesome sound. At his call, the dead awaken, rise to life from earth and sea. Now notice how it ends. All the evildoers shaken, by his looks prepared to free, flee. Careless sinner, what will become of thee? That hymn ends with a question. Careless sinner, what is going to happen to you, you who think that you're walking with Christ, when in fact, indeed, you are lazy in the faith and you need to wake up? What's going to happen to you on that final judgment day when Christ returns? What do we call that? Admonishment. A lot of Christians are uncomfortable with that. But why? If you take a look closely at this text, music is to encourage, exhort, but warn, but admonish, makes us think, where are we at with Christ, right? 
Now, moving on with this, you say, okay, music is to cause Christ's word to dwell in our hearts. It is to instruct us. It is to admonish us. The question is, what kind of music? What kind of music? You can say, well, church music. Yeah, I got to get more specific. So let's consider this. Stick again with the wording of the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, with what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All right, what are we to sing? We're to sing psalms. If you, would, if you would go through the, okay, I have the order of worship right here. Before our worship, we have a couple gathering songs. This is what we call spiritual songs. Then we sang Psalm 100. Then we sang Psalm 142, psalms. And then after the sermon, we're going to sing hymn 44, classic hymn. So when we put together music at Pathway, we're just not throwing stuff together, but we're very intentional about that. We want to follow the lead of the Bible to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, why psalms? Well, because if you're new to the Bible, you look, you crack open the Bible at the very center, and what you will find is what's called the psalms. There's 150 of them. And psalms were written um, for the purpose of memorizing for the purpose of meditation for the purpose of instruction for the purpose of reading in private reading together and also a number of these psalms were put together for the sake of God's people to sing we should sing the psalms and the thing is that when the apostle Paul wrote these very words the psalms were historically sung for many centuries so Psalms had a historical precedent in the church. So what the Apostle Paul is doing is, listen, we're in the early New Testament church times, and since we're new, what we're going to do is we're going to just throw out everything in the Old Testament. That's not what you find. He takes these Psalms that God's people have been singing for centuries, and he brings them forward. But he brings these Psalms forward not only for the sake of a historical precedent, because it was the practice, but also because it's commanded by the Lord. Listen to this from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord, and let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And the very last thing he says here is let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Literally, in the Hebrew, it reads like this. Let us make a joyful noise to him with psalms, psalms of praise. So not only is it a practice of the church throughout the centuries, but God himself says, I want you to sing psalms. I want you to sing psalms. I, I, have, um, I have visited many churches, and what I've, I told you this before, when, I go on vac- uh, when my family goes on vacation, um, we will sometimes go to our kids' church, or sometimes if we're not with our kids, what we do is we go to different churches evangelical churches, Baptist churches, what have you. And I'm always struck, and if you've had this experience before, not to bash other Christians, but just as a, as a point of education, that oftentimes when you go to modern Christian churches today, very rarely, if at all, will you ever hear any psalm song. Now I want you to listen to this about the beauty of the psalms. Uh, a man named John Calvin put it like this, an AV if you put on that one final Look at this quote from a man named John Calvin. He said this, When we have looked everywhere and have searched high and low, we will find no better songs, nor nor more appropriate for worship than the Psalms of David, which the Holy Spirit made and spoke through him. And when we sing them, we are certain that God puts the words in our mouths as if he himself were singing through us to exalt his glory. Psalms are a beautiful thing, and psalms should be sung. Sometimes we sing them to old tunes. Some churches sing psalms in the form of chant. Sometimes we sing psalms to historic hymnody melodies, and sometimes we sing psalms through compositions that were written in the last 10, 20 years. The point is, God says, whatever tunes you use for these things, I want you to sing psalms. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. But if you notice here, Um, In our passage, it also says 
that you and I in our worship should sing hymns and also spiritual songs. Now, what are those? The word, the word hymn there, uh, here, as the Apostle Paul uses, likely refers to certain songs that the early church sang. We don't know exactly those kinds of songs, but um, many commentators, if you do research on this, note that these were possibly songs that were based upon the, 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 the truths of the apostles and also based on certain segments of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, that were not inspired like the Psalms, but were uninspired, yet the church used the occasion to sing these songs in their worship. What exactly did they sound like? We don't know. We don't have recordings, but that's the term that's used here, hymns. And in addition to this, we have the term spiritual songs, and these probably refer to a broad category of songs that Christians, when they gather together for worship, would sing. The fact of the matter is, and you can do your own research on this, but when you look at it, you kind of go, hmm, hymns and spiritual songs. Even modern-day Christians and theologians and commentators today kind of disagree on the exact nature of what they really comprise, only that the Apostle Paul mentions those two categories of hymns and spiritual songs in addition to the Psalms. And that's, what, again, what we try to employ in our worship here. So, we sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to implant the Word of God into our lives, to instruct us, to admonish us, and then finally this briefly. The reason why we sing these songs together is to have the opportunity for us to live, uh, um, to, to lift our praises and our thanksgivings to God. Now, you and I, my friends, should be the most... I don't know, praising and thankful people on this earth, really. And why is that? It's because when you know Jesus, and when you've come to your end of yourself, and you have genuinely repented of your sin and believed in Jesus Christ, that what the Bible tells us is that we are we're rescued from ourselves, we are rescued from our sins, our sins are forgiven, and we are placed in a right and loving relationship with God. God becomes our Father through Jesus Christ, and we become His sons and daughters, and you and I together are called brothers and sisters in Christ. That kind of love, that kind of community, that kind of relationship with God is, is the most beautiful, beautiful thing in all the world. And so it stands to reason whether it be through the preaching or through our music or worship generally, that we would use these things to lift our praises to God for all the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. I, I think the psalmist puts it best in Psalm 105 where he says this. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him, glory in all his wonderful works. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing praises to him, lift your hearts to him, give your thanks to God for all that you have in Jesus Christ. You know, um, I forget who it was, if it was Mike when he was praying or Brent when he was praying, but one of them prayed something like this, help the pastor to, to preach, to preach the gospel. Part of the gospel, gospel means good news. Part of the good news is this, that God is so kind and so wonderful that he has given us the gift of the ministry of music not only to instruct us and fill our hearts and shape our lives, but to give thanks to Him, to God as the source of our every good. And we should, we should, we should love music. And may God bless the music here. And by the way, when we gather together here at 7 o'clock, and I, I want to encourage you, I know it gets to be a long day, and the second service today will be a bit shorter because we are going to meet at 7 o'clock 
hey, whoever is here, I know for you who have really little kids, I know it becomes difficult. But for, for most of the adults and some of the older children here and whatever young kids you want to bring along, let's get together. I spoke to the Christian Reformed Church. I went to their worship service uh, last week and I made a verbal announcement to them and a number of people came up to me afterwards. Some of them said, we plan on being there. Some said, it's, we're going to be gone on vacation. It's the time of year. But whoever the Lord brings to us, your friends, your family, us, the Christian Reformed Church people, whoever comes here, may we, may we come together as we sing and make music to the Lord. And may we be instructed by it. May our hearts be filled with it. And may we leave this place with a deeper desire to follow Christ and live before him with all integrity. May God bless us to that end tonight. All right, let's come together and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for the gift of music. Lord, we pray that you would bless the music ministry here and that whenever, Lord, we do music here, the attention would not be placed on us, but our attention would be placed on you and all the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So fill our hearts and form our minds this evening, we pray. Indeed, from week to week, as we worship you, not only through the preaching and the giving of our offerings, but through the music that we sing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we have sung spiritual songs. We